stories. I believe in the power of narratives. And so I feel compelled to ask whether you can tell a story that fundamentally does not belong to you. The stories that come into my life unfold primarily in conflict and post-conflict zones around the world. I work on issues related to wartime sexual violence and forced disappearance and other serious crimes that affect victims and survivors of violence. The stories we encounter are a product of the questions we ask. And the questions I ask are about patterns of violence around the world as well as the processes of formation of collective memory in the wake of mass atrocities. Cast in a certain light, these are not my stories. What storytelling and memory have in common is that they're both processes of selection. We choose which experiences to remember and what kinds of narratives we construct out of these experiences. Inevitably, or perhaps deliberately, leaving other experiences in the margins. As whole communities, societies, countries grapple with their memory of armed conflict, as they wrestle with the notion of not only individual, but also collective memory, separating one story from another becomes a lot harder. And so you have to ask, who really owns a narrative? The question is complicated, but there is a simple start. That narrative is not mine and you should be hearing from direct victims and survivors of violence. It is their experiences that should be at the center of the story. And so then the next question to ask is, what about the indirect narratives? Stories cross our paths, perhaps because we asked, perhaps because we observed, perhaps we were there to witness. And denying that life narratives intersect is a way of casting experiences to the side, leaving them to the margins, silencing experiences of violence. And so I stand here ready to acknowledge that storytelling is a responsibility, and ready to ask what that narrative responsibility consists of in situations of armed conflict. Ready to share some of what I have learned, working and witnessing and listening and asking in the world's conflict and post-conflict zones ready to acknowledge that I'm not the best person to tell this story, ready to also acknowledge that storytelling is messy, impact is complicated, and any narrative that makes it look easy, any narrative that draws a direct connection between storytelling and meaningful change and activism is an oversimplification, but also ready to acknowledge that we cannot let the weight and complexity of narrative responsibilities render us silent about experiences of violence. When I start thinking about narrative responsibility, the first place to start is itself an acknowledgement. Stories of violence have humans at their center. That is surprisingly easy to forget in libraries and universities when you're removed from the conflict zones themselves. I have a lot of disagreements with Joseph Stalin, but a primary one is that a thousand deaths are not a statistic. Statistics are useful and spreadsheets are useful, but they don't quite convey the full nuance and texture of experiences of violence and injustice. Frankly, if we cannot see or imagine a human face of conflict, we are standing too far. So what kinds of stories can the data tell us? They tell us stories about patterns of violence, and patterns are useful because they show us that violence is not random, or at least it very rarely is. It, too, has a rationality. At the moment, I'm working on understanding the patterns on enforced disappearance, a crime whose memory is entrenched in Latin America, but is not specific to this region. And the spreadsheets tell us stories about who's being disappeared, who's looking for them, in which regions. But it is through the stories of the surviving family members of the disappeared that the full dimensions of this crime come alive. Stories extinguish distance. With her permission and with her identifying characteristics changed, I share with you the story of Anna, 
A woman I interviewed whose husband was disappear disappeared excuse me, 17 years ago in a place in this region. When I asked Anna how she navigates this place between presence and absence, remembrance and grief, she said she celebrates her husband's birthday every year. On the day of his birthday, without knowing if he's dead or alive for 17 years, she has baked a cake and set a plate at what would have been his seat at the table. The story of disappearances for Anna tastes like birthday cake, feels like an empty seat at the table. Not all stories of conflict taste like birthday cake. Which brings me to my second observation about narratives and conflict zones. There is no universal face of victims, and there is no universal face of perpetrators. And that line between victims and perpetrators can be very hard to draw in situations of modern violence. And so we need to be cautious about not creating what Chimamanda Adichie in a far more famous TED Talk calls the single narratives. That one story that colors our impression of a conflict, a people, a place. Single narratives of conflict make conflict seem like the only lens through which to approach an experience. And that is an injustice to the victims and survivors of violence. Or, as one of my favorite feminist scholars, Cynthia Enloe, would put it, we need to approach stories of conflict with curiosity. We need to allow ourselves to be surprised. And it was right here in Guatemala that I learned my first lessons on the surprise stories that emerge in the aftermath of violence. A few years ago, I was asked to assess the needs of women in rural Guatemalan communities after experiences of violence. I was prepared to talk about human rights and psychosocial support programs. And while there's great value to these initiatives, the needs assessment yielded a rather different conclusion. When asked what the number one way to support them would be, those particular Guatemalan women needed entrepreneurial advice on how to open a nail salon. And anyone who's looked at my nails in the past decade can tell you I'm vastly unqualified to help with that. Number two, help with opening a chicken coop. Number three, help with opening a tortilla stand. And therein lie two really important lessons for me about storytelling and conflict. The first is that we can't allow the conflict itself and the experiences of suffering, trauma, and violence that emerged from it to become a single narrative. Being a victim or a survivor of violence is a profound experience and is a marker on identity, but it's not the only one. This is not to say that those Guatemalan women did not have experiences of violence to narrate or other needs, but in that moment, the stories that bubbled up, the stories that wanted to be told, were the stories about nail salons and chicken coops, defying our own narrative expectations. And therein lies the second lesson for me. Articulated in the form of a question by anthropologist Kimberly Thiden, what are the narrative expectations we impose through our expectations on victims and survivors of violence? One of the ways I best understand narrative expectations is through a gender analysis. Gender analysis are fundamentally analysis about power, as are analysis about class and race. And therefore, gender is not a single narrative either. It doesn't exist in a vacuum, and it should be examined in the ways that intersect with these other factors. Doing a gender analysis can tell us who's vulnerable in conflict, who is protected, to what kinds of violence may they be subjected, and that is a dynamic that is constantly shifting in wartime. Violence is not gender blind, and nor should be its stories. Crucially, though, our expectations of masculinity and femininity affect the questions we ask victims and survivors of violence, the narratives that we allow to emerge. In 2013, not all victims of wartime rape were women. The majority still are, and there's something to that pattern. But there's also something to the targeting of men 
How do we open up narrative space for men to talk about being victims of rape? How do we approach women who have survived experiences of wartime violence and not project narrative expectations of talking about wartime rape onto them? In 2013, not all the perpetrators of violence are men. Not all the combatants in the world's wars are men. But there's still something to militarize masculinity worth examining, right alongside militarized femininity. <clears throat> I recently interviewed a man whose family member was a victim of a massacre in a Latin American country, and he commented that the environment in his country is opening up to include more voices on the conflict. So when I asked, would you participate in the victims groups and support groups and discussions, he laughed and said, no, those are for women and they always cry. <laughs> now there is a possibility to do a gender analysis of his own testimony too, but his testimony tells us something about the spaces we create for people to be able to narrate their experiences of violence in a way that feels true and comfortable to them. Narrow spaces lead to narrow narratives, lead to silence. Now I'm aware this has not been the most uplifting of talks, and in the past 12 minutes, we've walked together through massacres and forced disappearance, sexual violence, mass atrocities. And so I have to ask, if we have a narrative responsibility in conflict, if that concept does ring true, to whom are we responsible? An obvious answer is to the victims, to those who lost their lives in conflict and can't directly tell their own story right now. Even though I dislike the narratives of giving voice to the voiceless, because that assumes a strange power dynamic, and it also deprives those people of their integrity, their agency, their ownership of the story of violence. We also conceivably have an obligation to survivors and to the faithful retelling of their story. But what about my obligation to you, the listeners? These stories are dark and full of trauma. So how do we tell stories of conflict in a way that is true and persuasive and compelling and moving and does justice to the facts of what happened in all their atrociousness while in the same breath, not passing on trauma to the listener. How do we do memory justice, traumatic memory justice, without perpetuating a cycle of trauma? For me, the answer has been compassionate closeness. I trade in the currency of love in my life, and I'm aware that love is not a word that you typically associate with conflict zones. I'm also aware that there are limitations to the prescriptive power of love for personnel serving in these conflict zones as they have to navigate professionalism, emotional boundaries, self-care. So while I acknowledge that there can be limitations to love in this setting, I don't see any legitimate limits to compassion in any setting. Compassionate closeness begins with one acknowledgement that is common to doctors, humanitarian staff, and storytellers in conflict zones. Do no harm. If you believe in the power of stories, as I do, then you can also acknowledge that stories can be mobilized for hate. Stories can be mobilized to incite more violence. And do no harm addresses exactly that possibility. It involves things like ensuring that we have people's consent to share their story protecting their confidentiality, their vulnerability, but also their integrity and their agency in telling the story. But it also involves some subtler responsibilities, like, for example, the responsibility to get out of the way, to put victims and survivors and people with direct experience of violence that may not fit in these constructed labels at the center of the narrative. And when that's not possible, when the memory environment is still opening up, the least we can do as we're passing their story on is to mirror their language. When I've worked with victims of wartime sexual violence, some of them call themselves victims because they feel it connotes exactly that, that an injustice happened, that there was a crime, that they're victims of a crime. Others choose the term survivor because it connotes exactly that, that they survived, 
Mirroring people's language is a way of exercising compassionate closeness. I could have closed a speech on compassionate closeness and storytelling in conflict zones without a plea not to deny stories their capacity to make us feel. We live in an era of rationality. We often treat feelings as though they assault our credibility, our effectiveness, our intelligence. And I'm not advocating that we sacrifice truth for sensationalization or accuracy for dramatization. What I am arguing is that stories can be vehicles of empathy if we allow them to be, if we ask and listen and observe with compassion. Storytelling is full of choices. As listeners, as witnesses, as questioners, as storytellers, let's also choose to feel.